Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nijda Tsaturgyan, and I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. Today, my guest was Lili Tenersisian, a PhD in bioinformatics and the founder and director of the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute. We spoke about what bioinformatics is, how she founded ABI, the commercialization of science, and how she plans to develop the bioinformatics sector in Armenia. Lilith, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for inviting. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited uh, to have you in the studio today because I think this is the podcast that I'm going to learn the most from. Uh, I've been interested in this topic of bioinformatics for a while now, but before we get into all that and before I ask you to explain to us what bioinformatics is, let's start with a little bit of your background. Can you tell me um, about your education and where you where you went to school? I went to school uh, so in to two places, but uh, starting from the fourth uh, grade, I went to Ananya Shirakadzi uh, Lyceum, which mm-hmm. was a um, uh, quite accidental uh, decision uh, from my parents and quite a good one because I really learned a lot from that school. It's a science-oriented school, is that right? Or? Um, so f- starting from the seventh grade, you choose to, uh, among two directions. Uh, it's either humanitarian sciences uh, or uh, STEM. Natural, natural sciences. sciences, yeah. So I chose the natural sciences direction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And yeah. basically there were a lot of uh, deep uh, yeah, educational programs in mm-hmm. biology, in math, in physics. Mm-hmm. And then where did you go to university? I went to the biological faculty of the Edelman State University, which was quite a surprise for uh, all of my uh, physics teachers, biology mm-hmm. <laughs> teachers, etc. Uh, so, like a lot of people were, uh, it, it was quite trendy in in that time. If you are good in math, then you go to uh, Yerevan State Applied Math right. Faculty to become a programmer, or if you're good at biology, you become a doctor. What year was this? It was 2006. Okay. I just wanted to become a you know a ecologist, so mm-hmm. I chose the biological faculty, and my parents uh, were actually both biologists, and mm-hmm. my mom uh, was a graduate from the same faculty, the bio- uh, biological faculty. So she tried to uh, convince me not to go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what was her reasoning? You know, like after the Soviet Union collapsed, they uh, didn't uh, continue working in uh, yeah. in, in their uh, specialization. So they just knew that uh, that the future for a scientist in Armenia was not very yeah bright, right? yeah yeah yeah. So and then uh, you graduated. You studied biology at at Yerevan State, and then. Where did you do your gra- graduate work? After that, uh, I um, actually in the third grade, uh, I accidentally discovered uh, my future PhD supervisor. Uh-huh. So I your third year at university. Third year at university, mm-hmm. yeah. So I started visiting the Institute of Molecular Biology, where I learned a lot of uh, wet lab um, mm-hmm. experimentation, and uh, yeah, in, in the future I will tell maybe later the bioinformatics right. uh, group mm-hmm. was established. But uh, the graduate work I did in the um, uh, State Ac- Academy of Sciences. Um, it, it was an interdisciplinary center uh, for masters uh, in biotechnology. Mm-hmm. One of the year was simultaneous because uh, it, it was a two-year master's program, and in the second year I went to American University of Armenia to uh, study computer science. Mm-hmm. So I got my masters from these two biotech and computer science uh, majors. Mm-hmm. So one of your masters was in biotechnology and the other one was in computer science from Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is it at this point that you started discovering bioinformatics? Um, I started discovering bioinformatics in in 2011 or maybe in 2010. Um, So uh, Arsene Arakelian uh, in the Institute of Molecular Biology, he opened the bioinformatics group. We initially started uh, in the same direction as it was uh, that existed at the time. It was uh, molecular dynamic simulations and trying to understand the three-dimensional structures of uh, proteins. Uh, We started with the familiar Mediterranean fever, which is known uh, as Yerevanian uh, disease uh, for Armenians. 
so the protein that's responsible for the development of the disease, its structure was unknown. So we started mm -hmm. uh, in the direction of discovering the structure. It was more of, of biophysics, etc. So genomics was not uh, our no number one priority mm -hmm. when the group was formed. Um, but uh, I remember that I was struggling with uh, some uh, Python scripts mm -hmm. because the program that I was running had these scripts and I needed to make modifications to, to those. Uh, and it was quite hard for me. I didn't mm -hmm. understand anything. Uh, and yeah, then we were writing a grant and my supervisor asked me to write something about computer specifications and I had no idea what computer consists of, like a monitor, a keyboard, <laughs> etc. How, how do you deal with this thing? So I just typed Wikipedia computer just to understand how to name the parts. And at that point, I understood that I really need a computer science education. Mm -hmm. And it was actually also a second thought of finding another job. Because uh, honestly, at some point, I was thinking of leaving science because I didn't have enough salary to right. uh, sustain myself. So it was, okay, I will start computer science. I will either be a good bioinformatician or I will have a second uh, choice of... Being a, a software yeah. engineer. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then you're at AUA and YSU, you're completing your master's. At what point did you decide that you were going to take the academic route and go do your PhD and become a researcher? I didn't choose. Uh, I, I didn't <laughs> make the decision. Uh, so I did both. Uh, unfortunately, at some point in my uh, life, I had to study at two places and work at two places at the same mm. time. Uh, so my computer science education enabled me to do a freelance work. So I was a freelance Java developer at a US company. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, I was doing my academic uh, work uh, at the Institute of Molecular Biology. Is the the Institute the Institute of Molecular Biology is in YSU, right? Is no, it's a, a Academy of Sciences. National Academy of yeah. Sciences, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was doing both of the things simultaneously, but then eventually, of course, I uh, software engineering was not interesting for me. Hmm. It was just a uh, means for financial income. And uh, while I was getting experienced in bioinformatics, and we already gradually switched to the genomics uh, side of things, yeah. which became much more interesting for me, honestly, I started to freelance for actual bioinformatics work. Hmm. So I could kind of switch from pure software engineer to bioinformatics freelancing, which was not okay again, because you need to spend a lot of time on your PhD right. or yeah, writing a research, etc. But at least you also gain some experience yeah. in the... At least it's closer to your field. Yeah. 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 And Is there a big yeah. market for bioinformatics freelancers? Yeah. Oh, really? Um, so basically the world is... Uh, yeah, the technological revolution that haven't, uh, happened uh, or maybe like 20 years ago has enabled a lot of biologists to produce enormous amounts of data. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, the academic system uh, was not fast enough yeah. to catch up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of biologists find themselves that they need to analyze the data and they don't know how. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of gap there. And uh, yeah. So they... They have to go out and find the people that can do it. There's just not enough manpower. Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, during your PhD, what were you s specifically focusing on? Uh, my PhD was uh, devoted to um, an interesting part of uh, our uh, DNA, mm -hmm. uh, the end of our DNA. It's called telomeres. Right. And uh, yeah, people have uh, decades ago discovered that these ends are uh, gradually shortening as the cells divide. So it was quite interesting for me. And uh, I was reading a paper uh, where it was telling, okay, while uh, these ends are shortening, maybe there's something happening to how our genes are expressed. Mm -hmm. And I was interested, okay, how is this shortening associated with uh, the aging right. uh, process? So we didn't have the opportunity to actually do experimental work. We, we did, but uh, the, um, the things that we could do were quite limited. At the time. At the time. Uh, and yeah, to my su uh, surprise, my supervisor told me that I can actually download some data from the web. And um, it, it was interesting because, okay, you can download the data from the web and there was no uh, like algorithm to actually analyze it. So you have to develop the algorithm uh, from scratch. Uh, for this particular purpose mm -hmm. and uh, it was maybe the first time I was developing something like that uh, so we developed the algorithm we started uh, analyzing uh, the data and 
my PhD topic was more like not not only studying the length of the telomeres and how they shorten, yeah. but also going deep into understanding the processes that maintain the length of telomeres, uh, which are important for cancer development. Right. Before we dive deeper into the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute, let's talk about what bioinformatics is so everybody, myself included, gets a, a better idea. Can you explain, like I'm not a bioinformatician, what bioinformatics is? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so imagine you uh, go to the lab yeah. and you can do two things. I, I will make it very, very simple. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, the bioinformaticians will be mad at me, but uh, you go to the lab and what you do and what you imagine you would do, you would look into a microscope and see some cells under mm -hmm. the uh, lens uh, and try to understand, okay, mm -hmm. why, why is uh, the cell from this... Um, a healthy person looks different from the cell from a person suffering from a disease and you ca kind of come up with uh, some inferences. Mm -hmm. But now imagine that you can actually just break down the cell, take out the DNA, mm -hmm. and of course you cannot look at the DNA because it's uh, small, etc. But you have a, you have a equipment an equipment that uh, e enables you to read the sequence of the DNA. And you not only have access to the DNA, you have access to all the different molecular types in the cell. There, there are lots of them, right? Uh, so the genes are in our DNA that get, they get expressed, meaning other molecules are produced from the information encoded in our genes. And these are the molecules can either be called RNAs or they can be called proteins, etc. This is a complicated stuff mm -hmm. that's happening inside the cell but uh, due to the revolutionary technologies that have appeared uh, some years ago you can actually read all this information so you just put that stuff into the equipment and what you get out is data which is a sequence of the uh, of like these molecules are like long strings of uh, monomers right. that uh, yeah read into some strings mm -hmm. of translated into strings of letters, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can uh, also have like the amount of different molecules, the abundance of different molecules, uh, the interaction, and all the different stuff in the digital format. So mm -hmm. what you get out of this equipment is maybe terabytes of data on a disk uh, or, or an other career. And again, you are faced with the same question. For example, you have 10 people, 10 healthy people, and you have 10 people suffering from a certain type of cancer. And what you get, uh, what the information you get is millions of different features, billions of letters in your DNA, uh, millions of molecules, each with number associated with their abundance in the cell. And you need to understand which of these features, mm -hmm. which of these millions of features is associated with the development of the disease. Right. That's a very hard problem, and it's not solved with statistical methods. Why? Because the classical statistics assumes that you have a lot of people and much fewer number of features. Hmm. And this is where the classical statistics works. Right now, you have millions of features and only 20 people. What do you do with that? And um, this is where you need to be creative. Mm -hmm. You can apply statistical methods. You can apply machine learning methods. But you need to have deep knowledge in biology. So right. you ha need to have deep domain knowledge because you also need to combine knowledge with the statistical methods in order to make this work. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you will have no solution to this problem. There is no, uh, there is no math uh, or analytical or statistical or machine learning solution to this problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is where a bioinformatician steps in. Are the type of algorithms that you, as a bioinformatician, use completely different and developed by bioinformaticians, or do you use some classical algorithms? But then, the ability to analyze that requires your deep domain knowledge of biology. Or is yeah. it a completely different set of algorithms? That's that's a good question. The answer is all of all of the above. Uh, yeah, all of the above. <laughs> um, so that there are different combinations. Um, a lot of bio like there are different flavors to yeah. a bioinformatician. A bioinformatician can come from a biology background, or can come from a math background, or from a computer science background. Okay. A lot of uh, a lot of biologists they kind of switch to the bioinformatics part, and of course, for the majority of them, uh, it's the using the tools that are available. Mm -hmm. So basically, ability to run those tools. Some of them are in graphical user interface, yeah. uh, so it's easier just you click on the buttons. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, uh, but some of them are just 
on the command line. So you have right. this black screen, you need to type uh, in yeah. white uh, letters. And <laughs> first of all, it's a psychological <laughs> bottleneck because oh, uh, I it was... It looks intimidating. I, uh, the first time I, I looked at the yeah. terminal, I was crying because it was so scary for me. It's like <laughs> black screen, white letters. Why is it that? Uh, and they uh, learn to use uh, these tools. And uh, actually, it's like important for them to understand, okay, you have an input to your uh, tool, then you get an output, yeah. uh, how you deal with this output do you provide it to another tool mm -hmm. and do you filter it out etc so there's a lot of work there even like if you just learn to use the tools yeah you need to understand how to make uh, the pipeline work yeah like the order of different mm -hmm. tools and people that are able to actually develop the algorithms or develop the software are much more rare Mm -hmm. And uh, that's unfortunate uh, because we need these people <laughs> in uh, the field of biology. So they are able to understand the problem and they are able to bring the like, latest developments yeah. uh, in the math uh, in computer science world in, in computer science world to the field of biology right. and sometimes you understand when you talk to different biologists you understand uh, that they are some sometimes reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. Sometimes using the wrong algorithm mm -hmm. and sometimes writing a code that is not reproducible because they are not specialists in that field. Right. And uh, it is very important for uh, the development uh, of science in the world that these people meet. Right. So it's a very interdisciplinary uh, field. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So in a traditional bioinformatics education at the undergraduate level, let's say, is it almost like a double major in computer science and biology? Or is it much more specialized? I think it is not so standard. Um, like there are a lot of master's programs and the bachelor level programs are only recently uh, developing. Uh, Just more at the graduate level. Yeah. Um, so these are programs in bioinformatics. Right. And uh, depending on whether this program is developed in a university uh, based on computer science, yeah. it is more courses are more in a computer science yeah. and a couple of like mm -hmm. intro to uh, like biology 101 or molecular biology 101 etc yeah. uh, and in the biology departments it's uh, the other way around mm -hmm. in the typical world of um, biology research today like wet lab research are bioinformaticians at this point involved in basically every research project or is it still a bit separate I, are there are there research teams that don't involve bioinformaticians mm -hmm. or is it a standard part of the process today all of the above again yeah. uh, so uh, there are some institutes where you have a bioinformatics core facility they call mm -hmm. uh, so this is a facility with a couple of bioinformaticians sitting in a room yeah. and whenever a biologist upstairs has a lab and produces a data they come to the this bioinformatician yeah. yeah and the core facility usually does some standard uh, analysis on this some some of the labs have bioinformaticians like if, if it's a lab with 20 biologists and one bioinformatician then uh that poor bioinformatician has, has to, to analyze yeah all the data, <laughs> all, all, all the yeah. data. <laughs> um, and maybe uh, I, I think in most of such labs the bioinformatician uh, themselves don't have luxury of having their own research project right <laughs> like so they have to join uh, constructing a story a from the beginning to yeah. the end yeah. but uh, more and more for for example I've been very like in my uh, uh, postdoctoral uh, lab yeah there people learn to perform their project from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. uh, the biologists learn to analyze their own data and the bioinformaticians. Uh, for example, I don't have a wet lab experience, so I pair with a, a wet lab uh, experimentalist. So it's kind of a, it becomes a joint uh, project. I've also done my PhD under co-supervision uh, of, uh, of a lab in Germany. And uh, there, people, all, all of the people are bioinformaticians. Uh, so it, it really depends. Uh, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into the story of the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute. Um, so last year in February, I believe, you founded uh, the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute, and you're also currently the director of it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how you came about the idea of, of starting a, a bioinformatics institute in Armenia. It uh, has a long background against. If we die, go back to 2011, where <laughs> when the bioinformatics group was formed. So the work that we were doing was quite interesting. From 2011, I think 
to 2015, it was only me and my supervisor in the group. Mm -hmm. So everything was fine. But the sad thing was that I was sometimes living, uh, like sitting in the room alone and there was no one <laughs> to talk to. Uh, and th this is not... Uh, the, this is not very efficient for the science to develop because right. you need an environment and you need people to talk to each other. So you were one of the only people at the time doing bioinformatics. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, of course, like we were uh, trying to reach out to some uh, scientists abroad to have collaborations, uh, so uh, to like produce the data that we need for for our story. Uh, we were writing uh, letters, uh, so I, I was like asking my boss to write the the letter because it will be more official. Uh, but we didn't have uh, a website that mm -hmm. would tell hello. We are this group, we are right. doing this, you can find out the details right. under this link, right? Uh, so this, you know, these details are important. Mm -hmm. So I developed a website, a simple WordPress uh, website. And it was quite funny that uh, due to this uh, website, uh, another girl from uh, Denmark found us. Uh, she, she just Googled and found a bioinformatics group and she joined uh, the group. Was she Armenian? Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, the group was okay, growing. Uh, it was like in 2011, it was already four or five people, uh, but with a couple of alumni already, like uh, um, having left the gr uh, group. But you know, like this development from 2011 to 2021, even though like we were doing solid research, we had a lot of collaborators and mm -hmm. um, everything was solid, despite the good science that we were doing, uh, I think the best uh, counting the circumstances, uh, the growth was not satisfying, right? And I was thinking of all the different ways that's possible to kind of uh, make uh, make the thing bigger. Uh, at the time I was doing my postdoc in Sweden, so um, when, when, I, when I left I had the plans to come back. But I was thinking, okay, I will come back, maybe I will... Uh, uh, establish my own junior research group and continue with the standard academic um, developments at the Molecular Biology Institute. Yeah, that was that was the plan. Uh, of course, I was thinking, okay, maybe I will uh, try to include students, uh, engage students into research projects of collaborators abroad, uh, making it more international so mm -hmm. that there's more exposure uh, for them. But it was all uh, in the frames of uh, Institute of Molecular Biology. And then the funny thing was I was thinking of how to solve the problem with these procurement uh, laws. Uh, this is uh, quite an impediment for uh, scientists in Armenia to buy reagents for their own research mm -hmm. because you need to go through a very lengthy bureaucratic uh, process. Is that like biohazardous material, things of that nature? Or? Anything, yeah. e even buying a pen. Oh, okay. <laughs> anything even like things were not difficult enough before that with this procurement law you cannot uh, compete with the world mm. developments and i was trying okay what scheme is possible so that you everything in a legal sense right yeah but you don't suffer from that and you are, are able to collaborate and while I was thinking uh, about all these different schemes, I don't know how the idea of you need to have a separate institution for this. You cannot be free. You cannot be flexible enough in an academic institution. Oh, I see. The procurement uh, regulations were for the university? Uh, for mm -hmm. any governmental, any governmental organization. Body, okay. yeah, even the university, if is a, since it's state-funded, it counts. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, maybe there are some uh, thoughts to change the law, but even if you get money not from a governmental source, even I if see. some person donates you the money, you still need to spend it in... Uh, yes. Yeah. So all, all these thoughts were kind of... Uh, yeah, hinting that you need to establish a separate institution. Another problem was that you cannot uh, have uh, a person working in a governmental organization which is not a resident of Armenia. Mm -hmm. And the growth that I had in mind, the exponential growth that we needed, uh, was not enabling us to grow in an uh, you know, organic manner only using the Armenian workforce. Right. You needed a very fast flow and a uh, very intense flow of people from abroad and you cannot limit yourself with, okay, yeah. you become resident, then on, on, only then uh, you have an official affiliation. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, yeah, let me, sorry to cut you off, but why do you think those limitations are in place? Because science, I mean, usually countries are, are begging scientists from abroad to come to their countries and 
and do do their work there because it's so advantageous for for that country and those universities to have them. Why does Armenia have such strict and it sounds like backwards laws around that? That's that's a good question. I think there is no easy answer to that. Um, sometimes, uh, of course, all, all those laws are kind of uh, cautious, like precautionary laws, so that you don't um, have corruption, mm. that you don't have etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So you need to be very careful, of course. And all uh, I guess every every country goes through this, so it's a very hard bureaucratic process, and then you make it easier and easier as the. Um, Years go by. Yeah, may- maybe as the level of your confidence increases or, or there are new mechanisms so that uh, they reduce the risk. Hmm. I don't know, for, for, uh, for example, for this procurement law, when you have a scientific environment, a very healthy scientific environment, where the main um, motivation of people is to uh, publish, get uh, uh, your science out, etc., uh, it is self-regulating. You can, uh, yeah. most of the scientists just don't do that because they're yeah. not motivated to... They have good salaries and they don't They have good to salaries, etc. So once you have that healthy yeah. environment, the risks are reduced mm-hmm. and you can also m- maybe, yeah, uh, right. make uh, the rules less tight. Okay. And I guess we're not there yet in Armenia. Okay, I see. Please continue your, your thought that I cut <laughs> off. <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically this thought of establishing a separate institution was there in place. And uh, also the philosophy of bioinformatics developments in the world. So uh, again, coming back to this uh, revolution that the technologies brought and the uh, uh, educational programs lagging behind uh, led to establishment of bioinformatics institutes uh, in uh, the Western world uh, like 20, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is the European Bioinformatics Institute, and there are also like uh, separate institutions in um, European countries, in, in America, in and in different places. And the role of these bioinformatics institutions is just to provide, um, first of all, ways to store the data sets that are produced in the country, the genomics data sets, etc., um, to provide algorithmic developments to support uh, different uh, uh, research institutions uh, in the country, and to develop the human workforce. Mm-hmm. Yes. Are a lot of those private institutions? Uh, no. Those are like uh, all of them that I know of are governmentally funded institutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. uh, private from a university, like they're not affiliated with the university? Um, I think some of them are, some of them are not. Some of them are virtual entities. Um, so like uh, some of them are called infrastructures uh, where people are affiliated with different universities, but they are also affiliated with the central infrastructure. So whenever uh, like a life, uh, like there is a research project in life sciences uh, that uh, is um, uh, overlapping the expertise of one of the persons mm-hmm. working in this or that institution, then they uh, provide a support to that. Mm-hmm. So again, all of the above, there are different arrangements in different countries, uh, but there is a significant uh, governmental uh, funding for right. these institutions. Um, and uh, it would take time to convince uh, the Armenian governmental entities that we also need to establish such an institution. And uh, the calculations that we had, how many people we need to have, how many people we have now, it was apparent that we cannot wait until this realization comes. Right. So we need to kind of uh, establish it ourselves and then maybe the things will, um, the collaboration with the government will come later. So um, you established this institute in uh, February of last year. Um, what have what have you guys been working on over the last year and what have you achieved so far? Yeah, so of course, having established in the first year will not enable me to talk a lot about research. Right. So there was a lot of infrastructural development during the last year. So what we were doing was uh, actually working the first half year, working on developing the community hmm. of getting people together, telling people what we're, uh, of what we are doing. So like we were talking to different people, finding biologists in the diaspora and it was an interesting discovery for me that sometimes it, it's like there is no joint community sometimes i was finding a person doing his own research in his own lab and you just find these people 
And uh, the interesting part is that sometimes they just try to do that uh, for, for themselves. Yeah. So it's kind of viral and then f uh, they find their friends yeah. and they, their colleagues come, etc., etc. So by the month of March, there was already like uh, more than 40 people mm -hmm. that you were talking to. And I was telling, yeah, we need your support uh, so that the students can learn, can engage in uh, different projects, etc. And then the question was, okay, so we are ready. We are ready to support. What's next? Where are your students? Yeah. And I was, uh, yeah, right. Where are our students? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was, okay, apparent for me that we need, uh, like, we, we had a plan. We had a long five-year plan. And, like, we, we had several projects, but some of them were educational, although our main purpose was not to be an educational institution. We were there to do research, right. to produce people that would then feed the industry. That was our ultimate aim. But uh, the, and the educational programs were somewhere there. But the question uh, that these people raised, where are your students, brought this educational program into number one priority. Right. So I was, okay, we need to have a summer school. Mm -hmm. And we need to have a summer school, which is not like uh, other summer schools, like two, three weeks long, uh, that are just for networking purposes <laughs> most of the time. We need to have an intense summer school because students in Armenia that ha have biology background or uh, computer science background, since there is no genomics environment, they don't really know what bioinformatics is. Mm. It, it, it sounds fancy. Right. Uh, right. I want <laughs> to be a bioinformatician. Yeah. Because yeah. it sounds very nice. I <laughs> want to do some magic right. and yeah, <laughs> things can uh, right. cure people. Right. Um, but they don't really know what that is. Right. Uh, yeah. And sometimes I had, um, before establishing the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute, I uh, tried to deliver lectures uh, and um, doing some popular uh, things. And I remember a funny story. I delivered the lecture once um, about bioinformatics, telling what it actually is. A student, uh, um, like before this lecture, there was a student who tried to um, find internships in bioinformatics. And then after listening to my lecture, he called me and said, okay, after your lecture, I understood that I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> get engaged into bioinformatics, which is quite important because people don't, yeah. it's, it's important for them to understand That's what right, it yeah. really is, right? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of jumping no, back okay. and forth. Um <laughs> Yeah, so we needed this long summer school that will tell people what bioinformatics is. Mm -hmm. And uh, our uh, intention was that maybe part of them will love it mm -hmm. and will, they will stay with in it. it. It was like a significant part of them that loved it eventually, but uh, mm -hmm. that's another topic. So Were those participants... Um, either from biology or computer science, or did, the, did some of them have the interdisciplinary education of both biology and CS? Yeah, no. Uh, so they uh, were either from biology, from medicine, or from computer science. Um, so interdisciplinary education uh, was not there at the moment. This was last year, right? It, this was last year, yeah. We had 47 applicants, and it was strange because 11 week long summer school where you need to be there like seven hours a day hmm. is kind of full time job. Yeah. Uh, during the summer when all the students want to rest. Yeah. We didn't expect 47 applicants. It was uh, quite motivating. We chose 20 of them and we started working. Uh, it, it was uh, very hard work and uh, the PhD students uh, of uh, the former bioinformatics group that I was involved in uh, did a very hard job of finding all the educational resources, online yeah. materials, putting uh, things together. And we had quite uh, some uh, intense program of self-learning, yeah. peer-to-peer education, and 38 speakers mm -hmm. from 11 countries. They were... Uh, like giving lectures at the end of each day. So it was an, an exposure, uh, quite an exposure for them. And we had the retention of 10 students after the school. They are still like coming to the institute every day. Each of them is involved in a research project. Okay. And are they graduate students? Most of them are at the bachelor level. Okay. And this kind of highlights the gap that we have in Armenia. So uh, you have a lot of motivated, enthusiastic and talented students at the level of bachelors. Then they leave uh, the country or they switch to, if they're from computer science background, then they switch to IT uh, sphere. So in the master's level, it is very hard to find people. Yeah. 
in the PhD level. Yeah, it's even it's harder. Or <laughs> it, it's even harder. Yeah. So when we started the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute, we had only two people in Armenia that had a PhD. In, in bioinformatics? Yeah. yeah. And if we count the needs in Armenia, uh, were you we one need of those 30. Two <laughs> I was one of those two. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really tough. Dur during the summer school, of course, the supervisors were told that, may, like, if you have a research project, please uh, provide uh, the topic to the students. And so the students were told, okay, if you find the topic of the a uh, researcher that like you hear the lecture ab about interesting that you can refer to this researcher and and this is how these research projects uh, were formed but another interesting development happened uh, outside of the summer school um, I was talking to my friend uh, at, at the Harvard University and he was uh, doing a genetic engineering research by then and he was interested uh, in how we can uh, collaborate uh, with the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute. Uh, this discussion led to uh, an idea of uh, another program. We call it the Mentor and Venti uh, program. Uh, basically, he is a life science researcher involved in a very interesting um, topic. But he needed a bioinformatics support. And basically, I, I told, okay, please describe your research project. I will find a student that can do the data science part uh, of, of, of your research. Uh, interestingly enough, at that time, I just uh, got, got an email uh, from, from a student uh, at the American University uh, of Armenia. Uh, she just heard um, my lecture about bioinformatics before. So she just wrote, okay, can I participate? And I'm, um, I was, okay, you can participate. And remembering the prior discussion with Eric from Harvard, I was, uh, I, I thought maybe I can just put her on, on this research project. And the idea is that, okay, she provides the data science part uh, and uh, Eric is uh, engaging her in his own research. So it's kind of both a mentor and a mentee uh, in, in mm -hmm. terms of learning stuff as well as teaching stuff. The problem for me was that all of these research projects, all of these developments were quite overwhelming. And I was myself in, in involved in an administrative staff a lot. So maybe half of my time is now in the administration. It was quite lucky for me wh when I discovered that this student is quite independent. Mm -hmm. So she can do Google research. So I, I tell her, okay, can you do this? And she Googles it and she does that. And she comments her code and she explains it very well to Eric. And in, in the first time, like uh, I was having these weekly discussions, the three of us, and I was uh, maybe talking to the student very frequently. But in the end, I understood that they are quite independent. And kind of enables and, and this type of developments are everywhere like uh, you attach a student to a researcher uh, or a research supervisor you tell them don't worry we will take care of your student we will troubleshoot their errors we will uh, do everything you just need to spend one hour per week just to put them into uh, on the right direction on yeah. the right path and if you think about that it's not possible to supervise uh, if, even though I have the backing of the senior researchers uh, who are involved with the institute and I have the backing of the PhD students who uh, can be mentors it's not possible to get mm -hmm. engaged into more than 10 research projects at the same time doing all this administration stuff etc and it is quite amazing how independent these students are and only that uh, actually allows all this to happen. And we are go growing quite fast. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this, this growth is uh, actually dependent yeah. on the talent that we have here mm -hmm. in Armenia. Part of what you're focusing on is first, I guess, building, those, uh, building the community of professionals you need to be, to be able to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, is there any activity at the university level to have a, a like a proper bioinformatics master's program or PhD program? Um, yeah, so there are different universities. Each of them has a different uh, view on this. There are some developments. That's uh, good news. Initially, the Yerevan State University had a bioinformatics master's, but uh, this bioinformatics master's is, again, more um, focused on uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Mm -hmm. So uh, the genomics program is uh, quite weak mm. uh, there. 
Russian Armenian University has a department of bioengineering and bioinformatics. It's more biology and more bioengineering rather than bioinformatics yet. Uh, but of course, it's switching. It's it's a five year specialist program, so combining a bachelor and masters. Uh, and the American University of Armenia has recently launched a data science bachelor where there is a bioinformatics track. Mm. Uh, and this time it is more data science and less biology. So all of these programs, they provide seeds of bioinformatics expertise. Yeah. Uh, they just poise students into this direction. And then the rest of the education is not there I in see. Armenia. So and they can't really f- continue to their end goal. Yeah. yeah. So this, thi- this, is, this is the gap that we want to, to fill. fill. Yeah. yeah. And then... Um, what uh, what research projects have you guys already started research projects or are you still in the community building phase? So we have started research projects. So um, the students that are uh, engaged with our activities are either working with their remote supervisors, mm. so bioinformaticians from abroad. Uh, they spend uh, quite a lot of time with the students and they just engage them in their own research. Um, How did you find those people? Those ab- from abroad. Networking, so, yeah. human, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Were, are they mostly Armenians from abroad? They or? are mostly Armenians, but interestingly, there are people also that are non-Armenian. Um, I want to stress that the chairman of uh, ABI is a German uh, professor mm. uh, from Leipzig. And uh, yeah, they, they just want to help. And um, That's incredible. Yeah. I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, like, part of them are uh, either uh, involved with these research projects, and yeah. uh, we considered that as a training phase for for the students. But part of them are already in involved in uh, labs. Um, so we have two, uh, like, one lab that's uh, led by uh, Professor Hans Binder. Uh, it's a remotely mm-hmm. uh, supervised lab, and then the other one is a junior research group uh, supervised by me and. Um, there are several grants that students uh, are involved in. It's either uh, governmental grants to the Institute of Molecular Biology, so the students are partly affiliated with that institute and our institute, and uh, there are also uh, different uh, uh, one grant from PMI Science that we got recently, mm-hmm. uh, and there are some projects that we just do with no funding. Uh, yeah. Over the last year, the uh, especially since the end of the war, the government in Armenia has spoken about this need for greater funding in science, and I think they increased the budget mm-hmm. uh, somewhat last year. Has this uh, has ABI been able to make use of this increased funding and availability in grants? Not directly, not directly, because uh, ABI is, as a non-governmental institution has a limited eligibility to all these uh, grant programs. Uh, of course, uh, again, people uh, at ABI are also partly affiliated with uh, governmental uh, organizations, so it's possible to collaborate in this okay. sense. So indirectly? Uh, yeah. Indirectly, but not directly, not unfortunately. Directly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lilith, uh, I want to talk to you about this uh, this idea of commercializing science. Mm-hmm. Um, bioinformatics sounds like it is a space that could possibly launch a lot of startups. Have you seen this trend in in bioinformatics has have do some of the projects that are that start in a postdoc or in a phd mm-hmm. lab um, end up becoming startups or has bioinformatics not yet matured to that stage and that's a very good uh, question so we've had uh, experience of uh, startup developments ourselves and also noticing other developments it is very hard for a pure bioinformatics startup to flourish most of the times, if it is genomics, then uh, you also ha- need to have the wet lab infrastructure in place. Mm. So it need to be both because bioinformatics uh, software or developments is very hard to sell. Yeah. People like buying stuff that's tangible, tangible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you just cannot sell a software and uh, be happy with that. Of course, there are some exceptions to this rule, but it's very hard. And in order to be successful in these realms, you need to have people. Mm-hmm. And basically, our main endpoint uh, is not only to to do basic research, is to create the human capital that yeah. will enable all the biotech companies or startups to get established in Armenia. Because right. you need uh, employees to right. in your you need companies, right? in order to be able to build those companies. Yeah, yeah. you need both bioinformaticians, you need uh, experimentalists, you need yeah. the whole package. Yeah, uh, bioinformatics is just one piece of it. One piece, a very important piece, 
a piece yes. without mm -hmm. which you cannot have uh, modern biotech developments in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but we realize that it's only one of the pieces. Yeah. So there is a need for simultaneous development of all the different things. We have this idea of partnering with industrial companies. We cannot uh, have the luxury, you know, of only doing basic research because there is no industry and there is no motivation for the students to choose the path because they don't have, uh, they don't see any future yeah. if, if there is no marketplace. Yeah. And like, as opposed to, for example, tech developments or as opposed to machine learning, etc., where you can establish a basic research lab because you have at least some industrial uh, environment around you. Yeah, to uh, support you. Yeah. yeah, we need to do everything yeah. at once. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to uh, distribute the resources yeah. in, in a way that you, uh, your research doesn't suffer. Mm -hmm. So we have recently had agreements with three industrial uh, companies uh, one in the uk and one in the U uh, two in the us mm -hmm. and the strategic partnership that we have agreed upon assumes that okay these companies fund us so that we develop a team from students initially beginners in the field uh, that would learn the skill sets that's needed for the development the research developments in that company yeah and this is uh, maybe a transition phase for these companies. They cannot establish themselves just, okay, I want to have my branch. I have to have my team in Armenia. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, if these developments are successful, if these partnerships are successful and the students eventually grow to be independent uh, players in this company, mm -hmm. uh, then it can have uh, like uh, build the ground for them to at least establish their data science, yeah. data analytics part. And the way I imagine in this, this gradually develops the environment where also other developments take place. Where bioinformaticians can come in and, and play a role in all of that. Yeah. So that we have a, a better idea of what a, a bioinformatics-oriented company would look like, mm -hmm. what are some examples of problems that startups in the space are working on? For example, is drug discovery um, a part of the bioinformatics space? And before I let you answer, let me just for our, our listeners... Um, Speak a little bit about what a, a drug discovery company is. Mm -hmm. Over the last, I would say, five, six years, there's been a bunch of startups that have uh, come about that do drug discovery work in the sense that they build these algorithms, which um, you could speak to this better, but pair mm -hmm. different chemical compounds yeah. to develop some, discover some drug that could work for some disease. Mm -hmm. Is that an example of a bioinformatics company so uh that is an example of a bioinformatics company although um we again divide the bioinformatics into structural bioinformatics where you deal with uh, as you said the st structural yeah. basis of drug uh, molecule interactions and there is the genomic space where you just have big data yeah. analysis problems uh we do have success stories in the first uh, scenario where you have this uh, modeling of the interactions and finding yeah. uh, drugs and uh, understanding whether they are good uh, interactors for your targets, etc. We have a couple of nice companies already developing in Armenia, which is quite a good news. Um, in terms of genomics and big data analytics, um, again, there are drug discovery uh, startups, and uh, we, we also ourselves had some developments in that field. Uh, it's not about the mo modeling uh, the interactions, actual interaction of the drug with its target, it's more about finding the target. Right. It's more about uh, analyzing this whole data and understanding, okay, which of the target is responsible for your disease, yeah. for which target you need to develop the drug. And um, this is, well, we, we had uh, quite some developments uh, in this sense, and uh, we had an idea of a startup. And the main Im impediment that uh, I personally uh, think uh, was uh, not allowing this to commercialize uh, further was the lack of uh, human workforce. Yeah. Um, so we needed to find people, and I remember we had some funding, and uh, we uh, tried to find people with quite a nice salary in Armenia. And yeah. it was impeding Difficult. the development so this this is actually also a very important point so people are telling all the time that of course you need to commercialize what you're doing basic science is not enough that's true when you have a critical mass of people yeah. we are not there yet yeah you know i think 10 to 15 years ago um when when people were building startups they were primarily building startups for the web so 
you had companies like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and these companies arising in what people called the Web 2.0 space. And during that time, those companies that were being built largely just required a programming background, like a basic computer science background. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were built by people who didn't even graduate from university. These days, it feels like there's more and more of a trend towards what people call deep tech, mm -hmm. which is a, a startup that is built on something that required some form of research, some sort of innovative engineering that was not yeah. that had not been done before. Mm -hmm. So in order for a startup ecosystem to really blossom these days, I feel like the need for a strong science community is much more important today than it was 15 years ago. Um, and that's something in Armenia, I think, that we, we really need to work on in order to keep up with the rest of the world. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I think um, a nice example of that uh, is, is, is the work uh, I've been involved in in uh, Sweden. Um, so there, um, the host uh, lab that I worked in was focused on a new technology. And it was basic research in its uh, entirety. Mm -hmm. uh, so just trying to understand why RNA degrades the way it degrades. Yeah. And you cannot explain like people when when people are asking me, okay, what's your postdoc topic? I'm like, mm. <laughs> it's very hard to explain yeah. to people. And whenever it's very hard to explain, then uh, you know that you're dealing with basic research yeah. um, because you cannot yeah, understand the applications. Uh, but then uh, this technology appeared to be very useful mm -hmm. in an applied sense. So again, it's a, another type of drug discovery uh, uh, door that it opens. Uh, so this time it is drugs that uh, interact with the microbes mm -hmm. in our organism, so microbiome research. And there you need to have a lot of uh, bioinformatics developments in order to analyze the data that comes from this new technology and apply it to either clinical settings or to drug discovery. So um, like give uh, access to pharma companies to this technology. And this is a combination of technological inno innovation that happens in the laboratory with the bioinformatics developments. Both are very important components. Yeah. And you need to bring those two components to Armenia for, for these startups to flourish. Mm -hmm. This is what I understood in uh, Sweden, and uh, this is important for bioinformaticians to understand uh, in Armenia as well. Yeah. They are very important, uh, and the number of bioinformaticians, like if, if these 10 students that are with us, mm -hmm. and if we continue the developments, then we will have a very you know dense population of bioinformaticians here, which is quite rare in the world. Yeah. But we need to internationalize we need to collaborate, we need to partner because without these clicks, okay, this technology is very important and can open a lot of doors yeah. and just let's develop the bioinformatics side of things. We need to click in order to have uh, biotech uh, commercial developments in Armenia. In Armenia, yeah. yeah. Okay, Lilith, um, I want to ask you our last question. Where do you see uh, both the bioinformatics space in Armenia in five to ten years and what do you hope to see for the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute in in the five to ten year time span? Um, five to ten year time frame is very short. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what, what, what we would love to see in ten years time is having 30 bioinformaticians and maybe two biotech companies. That's what we hope for and that's mm -hmm. the most optimistic scenario. But I would tell that maybe it's not realistic. Um, so in five year time, uh, our goal is to have six labs that are supervised by a PhD level, uh, at least like a doctoral level uh, bioinformatician coming either from abroad or people that uh, have education in Armenia, six research labs that produce maybe two, three people per year. This will enable for, for a couple of biotech companies to get established. Mm -hmm. So once we have a deep genomics genomics related biotech company in Armenia yeah. that will be uh, an achievement and I uh, expect that it will happen maybe within a 10 year uh, period Time frame. yeah okay Lilith thank you so much for joining us and I hope you'll come back again in the future to talk about the further developments of ABI thanks thank a lot you. Thank you for listening to this segment of the EVN Disrupt podcast. You can follow us on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you consume podcasts.
Also, make sure to follow EVN Report on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date for more engaging content from Armenia. Thank you.